So in this afternoon's presentation, it's uh, myself, uh, I'm the director of CCAFs, Phil, who is one of the flagship leaders in CCAFs and has been behind a lot of the development of the results-based management framework, and Ana Maria, who is a regional program leader for Latin America. Uh, so I'm sitting in Copenhagen, Phil's in Edinburgh, and Ana Maria is in Cali. Let's get started. Uh, so that what we're going to do this afternoon is uh, it will be a brief talk of about 20 minutes, and then there's questions and answers. I'll give a bit of background. Phil will look at the global and regional impact pathways and targets. Uh, Anna Maria will then look at the re from a regional perspective, and we'll hand it back to Phil, who would uh, look at the planning and reporting system that goes be that tries to capture all the information that's happening in the impact pathways, uh, and then look at briefly at managing for results, lessons learned, and then a Q&A. So results-based management isn't really anything new in the climate change world. There's, there's a, all the different processes have these kinds of targets. In the UNFCCC, they talk about measurable, reportable, and verifiable, or MRV, and this is applied to greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation actions. The newly established Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture has a, has a target related to resilience, and uh, it will also be uh, watching progress towards that target. And then the SDGs, number 13, is related to climate change. And there will also be targets related to resilience, adaptive capacity, and policy uptake. So then CCAFs, at a very broad level, what are we aiming at? Our targets are going to be around farmer resilience and emissions reductions. So we have four um, flagships, and each of these flagships has global impact pathways. Uh, the first flagship is Climate Smart Technologies and Portfolios. The second flagship is about Climate Information Services and uh, Climate Involves uh, uh, Safety Nets. The third one is the Mitigation Agenda, Low Emissions Development. And the fourth one is about policies related to climate resilience. Where the action really happens in terms of our impact pathways is at the regional level. So it's at the national and regional level, where we, we uh, establish impact pathways around those flagships. And we're, we're going to work in these five regions that are shown here. The other word that you'll hear today is projects. So this is a, a large body of work. Uh, it can be any kind of funds, core funds, bilateral funds can be single or multiple centers, or it can be working across, it can be working in one region or across multiple regions. The key thing is that a project has to, to qualify for CCAFs, has to fit in within the, the integrated regional, uh, in, integrated impact pathways. So what process have we been using to get to where we are in 2015? In, in 2013 and in going into 2014, we started a, a results-based management trial on just one portion of CCAFs to test out various methods. And then in 2014, we started to put in place the system which is now going to be initiated this year. This involved defining global impact pathways, defining regional impact pathways, then getting calls for ideas around those impact pathways. Uh, once we'd ex um, uh, selected the, the various ideas, we then went into regional planning meetings where the specifics of targets and milestones related to the impact pathways were uh, determined. Uh, this was a very iterative process so that the, the bottom planning of projects 
at the sort of regional level and at the project level has then fed back into what we've uh, accepted as our global impact pathways and regional impact pathways. Behind the impact pathway work, we have something, a knowledge platform, which we call a planning and reporting system, the PNR system. And this is an attempt to capture the complexity in as simple way as possible and, and make it transparent to everybody. We'll come back to describing these various things in the next few slides. So Phil, I hand over to you. Thanks, Bruce. Well, this diagram attempts to show the relationship between the projects that, um, that Bruce has just described going up to the intermediate development outcomes or some of the intermediate development outcomes of the CGI um, towards which CCAFS contributes. And um, we see that projects are contributing to clusters of activities, um, which in themselves are then contributing to flagship and regional outcomes but at two different times into the future. So what we're particularly concerned with uh, outcomes at, at 2019 along the impact pathway and then also outcomes at 2025. And so these are the then um, our assumptions are that um, these impact pathways through achieving these outcomes at different times then will be contributing towards the, the IDOs. Next one please, please. In terms of the targets or indicators, what the nature of what these outcomes may be, for the four flagships, we've defined uh, a small set of, of targets. And this is an example for flagship one on the, the CSA practices. So on the right-hand side in green, this is the 2025 target for flagship one. So 30 million farmers, at least 12 million of whom are women, have strength and adaptive capacity and food security as a result, to some extent, of programmatic um, CSA investment. Um, at 2019, we have two targets that um, we believe will, um, if we achieve the 2019 targets, these will be on the way towards the 2025 target. And the 2019 targets are to do with national and sub-national development initiatives and also with public-private actors um, at, at the national and sub-national levels. And you also see we have targets for 2015 and 2016. And please, if you can show the next in the animation, then um, this is how project targets, so again, as Bruce mentioned, each project has is, is, um, needs to contribute to these targets and to regional targets towards the, um, the, tar the overall targets of the CRP. Next one, please. Then we hand over to Anna Maria. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, good. So, uh, in here, just to give you some idea of how all these that Phil and Bruce have uh, discussed uh, looks like in a specific region in Latin America. So, uh, last year we have a very intense work in terms of constructing this uh, impact pathway for Latin America, and this was done in a participatory manner where not only the CGR centers uh, were part of this discussion, but also uh, local uh, and external partners. So we uh, came up with a vision for Latin America for 2025 and we also discuss and, and construct these outcomes. We have four outcomes for the region, each one for uh, one of the flagships that we work in CCAFs. And the idea is that these four outcomes are going to be the ones that will lead us to achieve a, the Latin America vision that we want to have in 2025. The next one, please. So, and, and in here, in the following slide, just to show you a concrete, a specific example of the portfolio of Latin America. So, we just finished this uh, portfolio, and there you can see in the lighter colors the projects that are being led by the CGR centers, and then in blue, 
the projects that are being more uh, led by the regional program. And then we have also cross-cutting projects, which are really important uh, because they complement the portfolio for Latin America and they give coherence and make a very robust uh, portfolio. Also, uh, to emphasize that each one of these projects that it's in the PNR has its specific targets in order to uh, achieve uh, the outcomes. So, for instance, if we are working in Colombia, we have a specific targets for Colombia, but then all these are add up with other targets that we have for the different countries in Latin America, and then uh, these all add up at the, at the global level, so we have specific targets to see what's going on in terms of, where, out of our indicators for each one of the flagships of, of CCAS. Uh, the following, please. So in here, just to show you an example, a very concrete example of what's happening in Colombia, and this is very interesting because in Colombia we have like a, a small CCAPS because we are working in all the flagships that CCAPS is working on. And this was uh, really interesting. It all started as, as a, a diagnostic of what, ha what was happening in the agricultural sector in Colombia. And basically what was happening was that climate was managing the agricultural sector. So we had even El Nino, La Nina, this climate variability, and we were not prepared, so a lot of damages, uh, reductions in income, uh, threatening the livelihoods of farmers. So basically what we wanted to do and that we have already uh, began doing it is that uh, we want to work with the institutions in Colombia so that this situation uh, can be the other way around. So it's not climate, that it's managing the agricultural sector, but it's the agricultural sector that it's managing, managing climate to its own advantage or benefit. So in here what you can see are the, the pieces of this work that we have been doing in Colombia. We have been working on improved crop varieties for plots and droughts. We have been working on building this forecast, not only a seasonal forecast, but agroclimatic forecast, also in terms of policy and NAMA supporting the government with information to feed these NAMAs, and in terms of the adaptation plan for the agricultural sector, we have been working in the formulation and implementation of the plan, working closely with the stakeholders. And then these new projects, the ones that you see in the slide, eh, are the ones that are coming part of this new portfolio, and they are going to complement the work that we have been doing in the past 18 months in Colombia. So for instance, we have the climate site specific management, where you saw in the previous slide, and this is going to help us to get these improved crop varieties to farmers. And then in terms of this agroclimatic forecast, we have in our project of the climate smart villages uh, for Cauca in Colombia, we are putting together these tables where we discuss the forecast, but more important than that, we uh, discuss a specific adaptation practices according to these forecasts. In terms of, of the mitigation agenda, we are working on uh, greenhouse gases measuring methods for smallholders, and this uh, is going to be very useful to formulate the NAMA, and the government asks for this information. And in terms of the adaptation plan, uh, we are working with the methodology of socioeconomic scenarios, which has been proven to be very useful in the other regions of CCAPS that it has been implemented. So we are working closely with the government so we can have a more robust adaptation plan that takes into account the uh, potential different futures. And to close this loop, we have we just signed an, signed an agreement with Agronet, which is the platform from the Ministry of Agriculture, which is, has a lot of expertise in terms of uh, technologies of information and communication, so through internet, through uh, text messages, mobile phones, they are, they are getting all this information into every farmer in Colombia. So by signing this agreement, what we are doing is that all the information that we already generated and that we are continue, continue to generate in Colombia, we're making sure that it's going to go to farmers, and farmers will be able to use the information, not only in Colombia, but since Agronet has also agreements and works with other re, uh, countries in the region, we're also going to be able to reach other farmers uh, in the region. Back to you, Bruce. Okay, and actually over to Phil. To Phil, sorry. Okay, thank you. And now just a couple of slides on the, the planning and reporting platform, which is um, in a way the, the way in which we really try to, to pull many of these, these issues, to, many of these things together. Um, this is a, it's a, it's a bespoke 
system that's being put together by David Abreu and his colleagues at SEAT. Um, we looked briefly to see if we could find an, an off-the-peg solution, um, but we were not able to, and so the team has been working extremely hard putting this together. So as the name implies, this is a system in which we can plan and, and do reporting. And this shows the, the screen for at the start and a list of the, of the projects that the particular people may be, um, may be in charge of. Next one, please, please. And then for each project, um, there's, a, there's a whole range of different, um, whole range of different information um, that can be entered and, and, um, and aggregated. This shows a project description, actually, for, some, for the scenarios work. But on the left-hand side, you see the project menu. So um, this has a description of what the project is. And then further, further down, it has a listing of the partners, the budget, and the project outcomes, and then the activities. And so all projects in CCAPS um, have, have this kind of format. And for the reporting piece of this, um, the reporting um, is, is still being worked on, um, but we hope by uh, later on in this year we'll have a, a fully integrated um, system that's online and available for everybody to use. So the next one, please, please. In terms of the, the, the P&R process, um, it has various uses. Um, as you can see on the top here, for annual planning, um, then, of course, we need to be able to generate the information that's needed for the, um, the program of work and budget that goes to the consortium office. Um, for reporting, um, projects need to report against outcomes, against the targets and the deliverables. And for these, um, we, this information is needed so that we can generate reports on the topics that are needed, um, but also importantly for the monitoring and evaluation for results-based management. In the next one, please, please. In terms of managing for results, um, each project uh, needs to collect data on the indicators. And as remember from a previous slide, we had for flagship one, for example, there were two indicators for, um, for 2019. Um, the other flagships have a very similar sort of system. And so for the whole of CCAPS, um, projects need to be collecting data on one or two or more um, but, but mostly it's, it's, a, it's a small number of these eight indicators that together um, will result in, in CCAS attaining its, its objectives. And so projects need to be able to collect data on the indicators and they also need to be able to detail their achievements in terms of how are they actually progressing along the impact pathway towards their outcomes. And at the same time, um, each year, because of course, Projects aren't going to produce outcomes every year, but producing case studies on the outcomes achieved or on the progress towards these, and this is a, an important part of the system. And basically, it's not only projects, but also regions and flagships also have to be able to, um, to detail their achievements so that everyone's progress can be assessed. And as we're managing for results, there's a, we have a system in place for allocating bonuses for and for good performance, and this is um, the, the, the kinds of criteria are in terms of how well projects are really, um, are they producing outcomes, are they producing their deliverables, are they doing what they said they would do. Next one, please, please. As Bruce mentioned earlier in the talk, um, we've been trialing this process for, for a piece of CCAPS during 2014, and in this whole thing we've, we've learned a a series of lessons. One is, um, fairly obviously, there's quite a lot of time and resources are needed to really pull this all together and try, uh, to really try to make it um, into a coherent system that makes sense. Another lesson is that um, we're starting to recognize that new capacities are needed um, as we have this new outcome or this sort of enhanced outcome orientation and then things such as engagement and, and communications become extremely important. And these are capacities that project teams may not always have. And so being able to look at um, where, where do we need new capacities to really help us um, achieve our outcomes. Another big lesson, I think, is that 
we really need to be been trying to concentrate on making systems good enough. Um, in other words, make them practical and they're not the best they could be, um, but making them good enough for the purpose. Um, I think this is an important lesson. Um, we could spend a great deal of time and effort and resources in really coming up with a, a fantastic system. But actually what we need is something that will do the job um, in as simple a way as possible. And the fourth lesson to highlight is perhaps uh, and the RBM trial projects in 2014 are starting to do things differently. And it's partly related to capacities, but also related to um, the way that um, work is planned and activities are put together and the types of partnerships that the projects are, uh, are working with. So, Bruce, to you just for the summary. So, the this is the last slide. Um, so. What we've seen from 2014 to 2015 is really a major shift in CCAFs in terms of a new portfolio and a, a new way of doing business in terms of these interlinked impact pathways right from the ground project level up to the global levels. And associated with that, interlinked targets and milestones along the impact pathway. And then behind the scenes, I think it's, uh, this planning and reporting system is pretty crucial for success because it really allows you to track everything in the, in the entire portfolio. Uh, we recognize that it's a continual learning process for RBM. It's adaptive management. And, and so you will find on our website a whole, uh, a whole lot of learning briefs. There's a wiki where the RBM trialists are, are sharing lessons. And there's a range of M&E resources. I think the, the sort of motto in in, in putting this all together is that all of us are dealing with this in you know every all the CRPs all the research in these complex systems are, is really challenging but we have to look for solutions which are not going to be transaction cost heavy that are practical to implement and that are not going to take up all the resources uh, away from the actual research so that's it uh, any last words uh, for or and then Anne Maria. That's fine. Anything, Anna Maria? Yeah, I just I just want to emphasize that one of the um, most exciting things of the of the new way that we are doing business in in CCAS, it's the the regional perspective that CCAS is implemented into its program. So I really believe that understanding the the economic, social political context of the territories where we are working and involving since the very beginning uh, the, the partners, the local partners, it's going to be key in this uh, journey of, of achieving outcomes. So I'm really excited to see the, that the regional perspective, it's, it's, it's really uh, relevant in CICAS. Good. Thanks, Anne Marie. Uh, so we're open for questions. Uh, you just have to type them into your question box somewhere on the screen in front of you. Phil, perhaps this is a, a question for you. Is how, how did we come up with the numbers in these targets? Yes, this is a, this is a good question and I think the um, We've spent quite a lot of time thinking about these over the, the last several months. I think the, the quick answer is that it's been a sort of a highly iterative process. Um, and it's been, if you like, sort of validated or we've made sort of changes to these um, in, in a couple of ways. I think one, one way has been through the regional workshops that, um, that some of you will have been involved in over the last four to five months. Um, where we were asking projects what they thought themselves, they, how they would be able to contribute to um, to these these program targets, and then aggregating those, and then seeing you know, how were we doing, where we did, were we at the sort of the right order of magnitude for, for these numbers, and another way in which we've done some sort of very qualitative validation was just looking at how other large organisations also have have come up with, with their targets and indicators. And so I think it's a mixture, that highly iterative, um, and in a way, um, I think these are, these are sort of, 
in long-term numbers that um, that we think that we believe are, are, are fairly reasonable. I mean, they may through time they may get some adjustment, um, but I think most people um, in, most people are reasonably happy with these. Um, but it's it's not an easy question to sort of answer and say, well, you know, this is how we did it. But it's certainly been a lot of a lot of thinking and a lot of iteration to come up with what we believe are, um, are pretty much reasonable. Thanks. Um, okay. So I'm just going to speak to Martin. Martin, can you share us the questions? I don't see any yet. Yes, hold on. Okay, I've, I've, I found them. Um, how have staff been receptive to this new approach? How is the burden kept manageable? This is from Michelle. Um, I, I would say it's mixed. Uh, so in some cases there's uh, extreme resistance. Uh, in some cases, there's ticking the box to get around it without really uh, uh, thinking about it. But I, I would say, uh, in general, there's, there's, there's been a relatively positive uptake of the approach. Uh, we've, we've had regional planning meetings where scientists have come together together with partners. And, I, and, and in general, I think, it, I think that they've gone okay in terms of buy into the process. I don't know if Anna Marie you want to comment given you were at one of the regional program meetings. Yeah, I, I agree with you. For the case of Latin America, I think that it went uh, uh, very well. Uh, I think it was a good idea to have partners, not only the CGR partners, but, but outside from the CGR world partners in these meetings because um, Two things. One that they they became part of this of all this process, and and they they understood uh, how we are doing things. So I think that was a uh, very important, and a uh, and the relationship that that we start building in these in these workshops, in terms of, of of that we are all in the same boat, and that we all think that it is important uh, this resource-based management strategy. Um, I think that that was helpful, and and partners were very uh, comfortable with this. Thanks, Anna Marie. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Rashid uh, at the ISPC. Uh, any any attempts being made to coordinating the different RBM trials? So there were uh, this. Uh, the CCAFS trial was just one of the trials. I think there were about four or five others. Um, what, what the CRP directors are planning is another session like this where we share lessons across the trials. At the moment, we haven't done that yet, uh, Rashid. Uh, uh, a question from Michelle Rodrigo. How will you manage the data collection from local partners through filling out forms, data uploading to the system? Who will monitor this is being done? Phil, do you want to do that one? Yes, um, thanks. Um, this is actually the, um, the, the guys at David and, and colleagues at Seattle are actually in the process right now of designing how this is going to be done. And of course, it, this all has to be done in the in the context of um, the, the, the new CGI open access policy. Um, but we're designing um, sort of mechanisms and processes whereby data can be uploaded or linked. Um, if, if, you know, there are many people who like to keep their own data on their own servers of their own organizations. And so having links with documentation so that at least it's, that data is then sort of discoverable and downloadable by people who are um, interested in looking at it. Again, I think one of, the, one of the issues here is how do we keep this sort of relatively light without making it sort of overly burdensome. Um, and so I think this is one of the, you know, this is one of the tricky things that we're, we're currently 
currently sort of trying to trying to um, come to conclusions about. Um, but I mean, having making um, deliverables and, and data sets open and available, that's a very important part of, of what we need to be doing. The next question is, uh, do we know that we can do all of this with the available resources? Doing the research, doing the engagement with the next users, doing the communi M &E, the communication, etc. What if things turn out to be more burdensome than we initially planned? Can we incorporate lessons on workloads by making adjustments along the way? This is from uh, Jacob von Etten at Bioversity. I, th I think uh, one shouldn't underestimate the amount of uh, work involved in, in achieving in outcomes and that one does have to devote resources to work al working along the impact pathway as, a, as opposed to just doing the research. So, you know, my feeling is that, um, that if we want to achieve outcomes, we have to do this. And I actually don't even like the word transaction costs because in some ways the, if you want to achieve outcomes, the cost of business is engagement, communication, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, I, 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 I also take the, uh, the uh, Jacob's last, uh, can we, uh, last piece of his question, which can we incorporate lessons on workloads by making adjustments along the way? definitely think we have to do that sort of thing. I think it's a, it's a learning process and that we must be willing to make big shifts if there's things which are not working well. Impact pathways modify over time as the circumstances vary. How does your monitoring platform cater for these changes and the need to modify review impact pathways? And this is from Christian Roth. I think it's a great question, Christian, um, and 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 in some ways it's uh, it's what I've also been we, we've been talking about in the management team is that one should not spend you know, uh, an enormous amount of time trying to get the impact pathways a thousand percent perfect because the the likelihood that they're going to change is pretty dramatic. So, I, you know, I, I think one has to be really flexible about the impact pathways and be willing to make adjustments. But then, it, you know, it does come back to Jacob's question that uh, that means coming back to the impact pathways, more stakeholder meetings, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, uh, adding to the sort of burdens of the research process. So I think it's a balancing act, but I think there's a real need to have to change. I don't know if Anna Marie or... Full want to throw in anything? Yeah, maybe one thing could I just add would be I, mean, I think definitely we need to we need to be flexible. I mean, impact pathways, as I understand them, are the hypotheses about how we believe the world is going to work, and our hypotheses, of course, may be partially right or partially wrong, but they're almost bound to require some sort of adjustment through time. So again, one of the things that we're um, again, um, sort of not battling with, but trying to do right now, is to build in um, capability within the reporting piece of the, the PLR system, so that we can document or projects can document sort of you know why and when and, and where changes have been required. Um, it's not that impact pathways are set in stone, far from it, but it would be really useful, I think, not only for projects but for also for people who are involved in M&E and for, for drawing sort of broader lessons to be able to understand, you know, for example, if a, if a project's been working with a partner who's really key for developing, you know, for, for moving down the impact pathway towards outcomes, maybe that partnership's just not working for, you know, for whatever reason. And um, so a project may need to go and find another partnership that, that perhaps is more effective. But sort of having, having space in the reporting piece of the PNR so that these things can be documented and ultimately so that people can learn about how other, how other, you know, are there other ways of, of doing the same kinds of things that, that people can benefit from. 
Uh, Anna Maria, at this point, you want to make any comments? No. No. Okay. Um, uh, Phil mentioned eight indicators. Are these the same across regions and flagships? So this is a question from Rashid. Um, the, so initially, when the results-based management trial started, and Phil can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we had uh, many more indicators. We had indicators for different regions, different flagships. We had process indicators. And I think one of the lessons we learned very quickly was that the system we were de designing was really complicated. And in the end, we decided that we, we had to simplify the system. And one of the simplifications is, is that all the regions have come together to agree on indicators which can be applied across the regions and that can then add up into the flagships. Uh, next question. There's another four or five questions I see, so we better get it on. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a, a good one from uh, John Helen at Summit. Bruce points out that the impact pathways challenge faced by, by CRP, CCAFs is doing a great job, but to what extent are the indicators, outcomes, etc., linked to other CRPs so that we get synergies amongst the CRPs? That, the, that we should be capturing. Yeah? It's a really important point. I mean, essentially, uh, CCAF is not producing any of these uh, technologies. The, technolo the, the technologies like drought, uh, adapted maize, uh, 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 things around rice production, those are all produced inside other CRPs. So in some ways, we are definitely linked to the other uh, CRPs. We, I, I'm, I'm guessing we haven't made that explicit in our, our current impact pathways, but we should. And we do, one of the big issues on the management team agenda this year is uh, thinking about the whole linkage of, amongst the CLPs. Uh, how can, I, I'll let Anne-Marie answer this one. How can we verify if these target numbers are attained or not? This is the, for the indicators, anne -Marie. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, uh, the, there is um, there was a piece of the information that we were asking to report in the PNR that was that was new uh, compared to when we started with this, in which we wanted to see what was going on year by year. So, so a lot of these new projects are going to be uh, three, four years, but we want to assess what's happening uh, in each one of the year, and then and then the idea is that when with like working together, the flagship leaders, the regional program leaders, with the project leaders, we can see if we are in the right way of achieving at these numbers or not. So, and, and in the PNR, the, the, there is uh, specifically for, for for to to so the project leaders can put the numbers that uh, they are achieving, and that's the way that we can. Uh, see what's going on, but again, this is not only only uh, entering the numbers into the PNR, but a process in which uh, we from from CCAFs uh, uh, are participating with the projects to see if we are in the uh, right uh, road to 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 get these numbers. So, so so basically, that's the way that we are doing it. Um, another question from uh, Philippe. How are external partners reporting to the CCAF Semini system the responsibility? At what point RBM will influence the review of the CCAF's impact pathways? Uh, the frequency that we, we review the impact pathways, I think. So external partners are treated no differently from the CGIR. We have some projects which are led by external partners, and they will have to report in the same way uh, as everybody else. So we don't treat them any any differently. I, I think I'm right in that. If they if they are the same kind of partners as as we have within the CG, uh, at what point will the results influence the review? I, 
I, I'm thinking that we would reflect on, on, on progress along these impact pathways and changes in the impact pathways annually. Perhaps it would be quite a light review. And, and then um, we would do it on a, a, a more thoroughly on, a, on about a, a three-year cycle. Um, have you, how have you involved regional stakers in developing the IPs at that level? I think that question was answered by Anne-Marie earlier, that uh, the, regional, the regional meetings included the uh, regional stakeholders, and the projects also include, uh, so at a different level, projects will have, be having discussions, and they will, they will also be influencing the impact pathways at that level. How do you deal with a lot of CG centers working in one CSV with two or more flagship programs at the same time? Hmm. Yeah. You want to try that one, Anna Marie? How do you yeah. deal with a lot of CG centers working in one uh, climate smart village with two or more flagship programs at the same time? Well, just fair to say that that's what we want to happen. We want to have many CG centers working in in our climate smart villages, so 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 that's uh, that's what I would like to see in at least in Latin America, and, and I think that Latin America uh, we had it a little bit easier compared to the other uh, regions because since uh, we had like the, this new group of projects of the portfolio, where, when we already decided the, our climate smart villages with conversations with the different project leaders, uh, uh, we just um, try basically to, to that, that these actions, these, uh, 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 these projects would take place in our climate smart villages. So, so that's the, the first part which I think that it's working really well in Latin America. We have a lot of projects in our climate smart villages. Now the challenge, and as the question asks, is how to coordinate this. And, and, and basically, what, uh, and, and this is where the, the, the regional a program has a, 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 a very important role, and it's uh, uh, just uh, making sure that that all the activities uh, are coordinated, that they make sense. And, and again, I think that the, the the one that should be coordinated that, and that's what we are going to do in Latin America. It's the regional program, so we can make sure that everything that is happening in these uh, villages makes sense. Uh, that we are uh, taking into account synergies and that uh, we are working toward a coherent working plan in these villages. Uh, Michelle asks, will you be providing training on RBM to staff and partners to help with long-term buy-in? Ensure there's a common understanding of RBM terms. Phil, do you want to do that, given that you've been through the trial? Yes. Um, I think we are looking into um, well. We've all, we've done we've done some in in 2014 um, for some of the RBM trialists. Um, I think uh, looking more towards the future, one of the things we're going to be developing this year is a sort of support pack of materials that are online um, that can help people do um, what's what's needed. I don't know, some of you may have seen the, the CCAF data management strategy, and this also has a, a support pack to help people um, do data management. Um, and so we're, we're basically going to do the same kind of thing, um, but for M&E, um, for monitoring and evaluation and learning. Um, and so I think there's, a, there's quite a lot that I hope we can do um, by, um, through this means. Um, and also I think we should, um, Again, looking more towards the future, uh, we need to see how much, um, if there's a sort of big demand for, um, for, for formal training, then we can see what, we'll see what we can do. Um, but I think this is a, this is a, key, a key thing. I mean, this, a lot of this, this RBM, this sort of um, managing for results is new to many of us. Um, and I think uh, the training aspects are very important and we, we need to take them very seriously. There's another question from Rashid. Uh, perhaps it's for you, Phil. Your 2025 target is aiming at strengthened adaptive capacity for 30 million farmers. How do you plan to measure, track that? How to deal with attribution? 
So I, I just quickly say that that's the target for flagship one. There's also targets for the other flagships. But uh, Phil, over to you. Perhaps you can discuss a little bit about the M&E. Okay, on the, uh, we'll take the second bit first, on, on the attribution, um, I think um, we're not so much concerned with attribution as with contribution, and so I think perhaps the, um, if you like, you know, sort of 20 years ago, I think a lot of impact assessment got quite wound up with the idea of or trying to sort of track attribution in quite specific ways, but I think what the impact pathway approach, I think, is sort of a bit more amenable to, to thinking about the plausible narratives about how CCAVs and how the host of other partners who are um, who are involved in the work and even other partners and other players in, in working in a region or a village or a locality, how all these people are um, are doing things that are that are moving towards outcomes, and so I think it's the plausible narrative piece that can really then help um, describe how um, how CCAFs and partners and others are really contributing towards particular outcomes. I think that's probably more important than saying, well, if this is Simic did this, CCAFs did that, um, and that's perhaps not quite so um, quite so useful. In terms of um, adaptive capacity and, and how do we plan to, to measure and track this, um, I think there's a there's quite a lot of work that's that's going on. Um, on for this one in particular, we'd need to talk a little bit to Andy Jarvis, but I think there's a there's quite a lot of literature um, that exists on, again, um, indicators that can help um, to do this. And I mean, it's not easy. Again, it's I think it's finding the balance between um, getting sort of very sort of strong strong quantitative information, and then also having narratives that. Um, that present a sort of plausible and credible case as to as to what's been happening, but I mean ultimately, um, and by these are 2025 targets, and then, um, this will involve going and um, it's, it's about to in the end involve some sort of survey work, or um, maybe there are ways to do this through crowdsourcing, which again, which are things that whole idea of crowdsourcing me is that um, we are various people in the city are also looking. Um, so I think uh, if you look at the if you look at the CCAPS target the the difference in twenty nineteen and again Ria has mentioned this that the project uh, involved in the baseline to the where they are now in our page and the last time you know they are now in a several years time the sort of the TW remeasure. And in some cases this is this could be in some cases but it's just that's going to be done type of work. In a, in a few cases, you may actually need to reserve and work in about smart villages, for example. I think there's a full variety of different ways, different methods, and different means in which, in which we can get the information that we need to demonstrate that we are attaining the targets. But again, we need to be smart in the way we do this so that it doesn't become sort of all consumed. Thanks, Phil. You were breaking up a bit, but I think we I, I got what you were saying. Uh, so just a one addition is that essentially the monitoring and evaluation, all the projects are responsible for some aspects of that M&E related to their, to their own work. Um, there's two more questions and then I think we'll probably call it a day. How are you seeing the CCAF's approach to building the architecture of the program, being able to facilitate collaboration with other CRPs? I think perhaps Sarah, this is from Sarah Park at uh, Worldfish. Um, I, I think um, we I, I perhaps answered this in relation to, I think it was John Helen's question, is that uh, we, we've, we've got it on our agenda this year to really think through this whole connection to other parts of the system. So it's, I think it's still a work in progress. I, I'm, I, I don't think it's going to be a big challenge myself, especially, for example, linking into the commodity COPs, which we depend on for, for their technology development. So I don't, I don't see that as a big challenge. Um, 
It is, uh, this is the last one from Sean Pang at Also Worldfish. It's expected that project leaders should explain and convince local partners ab about adopting RBM. If so, what plans are in place to build their capacity to do so? Um, I, I, I don't know. Perhaps Anna Marie can answer this. Is, uh, my feeling is that some of our local partners are more amenable to it than, than within the CG, but uh, uh, do you want to try? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Bruce. Um, our local partners are, are, are a little bit, are more into the development side. So, so um, I think that they are very used uh, into, uh, into our RBM and, and, and I guess that if there are cases in which we really see that uh, we need to uh, make a case because we, we see that uh, this is not working, then uh, we can uh, work that out. But I think that in general, uh, this is the way that they do businesses. Uh, the, the last, perhaps this will be the last question, and it comes from Kwesi. Uh, uh, how do you see the particular interaction with the system CRP in relation to RBM and other collaboration? So I, I guess, Kwesi, I'll, <laughs> I'll take the easy way out and say it's a work in progress, where, as I've mentioned before, is that it's one of our key management uh, uh, issues to deal with in 2015 is to try and work out how we can work better with other pieces of the system. Uh, so I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any quick answers to the question at the moment. I hope you'll accept that, uh, that very easy uh, answer, Chrissy. <laughs> um, so I think that's all for today. I'll just ask Phil if you want to say anything, closing remark. Um, perhaps just to, to say it's, uh, all this all this work. I mean, it's been a huge amount of um, work on the part of very many people, um, and it's uh, probably what didn't come across when I was speaking very much was the um, there was a lot of excitement about uh, this this sort of change. It's hugely challenging, but I think it really does have the it provides us ultimately with the opportunity to. Um, perhaps to be more effective in, in, in the way that we do our research and, um, and in the impacts that it may have. And so while it's a lot of work um, and there are a lot of challenges to believe on that, ultimately just, I think it can really do a huge job of making us all more effective. I think it can really do a Anna Maria, anything or it's okay? It's okay, Chris. Yeah. So I'll just close off. Um, with an anecdote is um, so one of our regional program leaders is a fantastic scientist, uh, IPCC author, hundreds of publications, and uh, perhaps he had uh, too many whiskeys, but uh, he came up to me and said, you know, Bruce, why didn't I start doing this 20 years ago? So it's a, a real convert to the process, and uh, in relation to achieving. Uh, interesting outcomes from his research. He, he, he felt that for too long he'd been producing papers, but uh, the, this, this whole way of doing business was really exciting in order to link science with society. So I think, you know, to, to reiterate what Phil says, there's a, although it's a lot of work, it's challenging, it's a change process, there's also lots of excitement and interesting stuff happening. Thanks everybody for attending this afternoon. I hope the technology worked well and we'll send the PowerPoints around to everybody after the seminar. Thanks a lot.